Well, welcome to the show. This, this is Our View from, from the Bench. Well, welcome to the show. I'm Brendan, flower trimmer for the Rose Bowl. And I'm Corey, eligible receiver for the Detroit Lions. And uh, happy Thursday. It's been a quick turnaround for us this week, but here we are, man. Yeah, happy Thursday, man. I'm feeling a little bit better. You might be able to still hear something in my throat, not uh, quite 100%, but definitely better than I was last week and still even small incremental improvements from Tuesday. So how the past couple of days been for you, man? Pretty good, man. Uh, Tuesday after we did our uh, podcast, I just had a game to work yesterday. Unfortunately, the Ducks lost, even though uh, Dostal had, I think, 61 saves, which is like a new franchise oh my record. Gosh. And against Toronto, who was on the second night of a back to back against LA, like we had the lead late in the third. We gave it up, went to overtime, and ended up losing because <sighs> Austin Matthews is really good. I think he's got 30 yeah. goals now leading the league. So, unfortunately, oh we lost. But, you know, it was a good game, and uh, it's good to see that even when uh, Gibson's time comes, whenever that is that he moves on, that at least we got somebody ready to go between the pipes for the future. So, but other than that, yeah, that's the lot, thing. Man. The Ducks, the Ducks season this season is a lot of, I mean, there's not only youth on the team, but it's a lot of growth, new coach, new players, yeah. infusing, you know, early draft picks, especially our number two. No offense, but, you know. Yeah, unfortunately, again. He, <laughs> what did he do? He uh meniscus thing about two weeks ago. I think he's out for like five, <sighs> six weeks or so, so he's not playing Brilliant. right now. And it seems like every time we get one guy back, we lose two or three more. It's just, it's nah. just not our year right now, so. But it's all good. We're young. We're upcoming. Hopefully, in the next right. two years or so, we'll be uh, we'll be making some noise in the playoffs again. But we'll see. Start but how was your last couple of days? Obviously, you said you're feeling a little bit better. But beyond that, um, honestly, not too bad. Just been working, trying to get ca- caught back up on that. Um, been because I I didn't technically call off on uh, Tuesday or Friday when I was sick. So there's a lot of emails sitting in the inbox that I had to kind of get through and stuff like that. But Another day, happy tomorrow is Friday, that's for sure. Uh, and excited to talk about uh, sports, man. It's like uh, I look forward Always. to this time hanging out with you and shooting the shit. So um, excited for it. But before we get started, uh, if you're not already, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the new episodes that we got. And if you like what you see, hit the like button. Oh, before you all go on about that, you always say we always say hit the like button. I heard that there's a new thing in the maybe this is something we don't know because we're old at this point, but the new uh-huh. lingo is to smash the like button. Oh, button. smash! Sorry, yeah, smash it. Smash. Just making it. sure we let everybody know, smash that like button when you see it. Smash it. All right, I like it. Okay, <laughs> sweet. Well, then let's dive right in, man. Um, we're gonna start with football again. It's, uh, week 18 is here. There's a lot of games, still 20 teams technically vying for a playoff spot. What the hell? Uh, it's going to get weird. A lot of situations. We explained some of them in the previous episode. If you missed it, go check it out. Just a couple of days ago, you can see how someone gets in and who can win certain divisions by what games. Uh, we're going to cover a couple of those games today. We're going to start in Corey's division, the AFC South, with the yeah. Texans and the Colts. This one, to me, honestly, there's really only two major games this uh, season, or this season, this week, which is what we're going to cover. But this is the one that I'm most excited about because I feel like it's the most even matchup. Um, and it also is uh, important because not another team that has the same record is, is, uh, is fighting for the same division. But this one kind of really sets it up. I'll let you kind of start it off, man, because I know this is the AFC South, a little, a little hitting home for you. Well, what do you see in this Saturday, man? The biggest issue for me for this game, at least, is, I, one, I want the Texans to win because as a Titans fan, I can never root for the Colts after all the years of Peyton Manning <laughs> taking our ass and of making us not win the Super Bowl, possibly, so that's annoying. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is, is in order for one of these teams, whoever wins, to win the division, they need the Jags to lose to the Titans. I don't want to oh. lose. I don't want to win because I want a higher draft pick. So yeah, I'm I'm really torn in a lot of places with this. But uh, like I said, I'm rooting for the Texans. I think C.J. Stroud and and D'Amico Ryan's as a rookie court or coach as well is a big deal. And you know, Minshew Magic is cool and all in in, in uh, Indy. And again, they've had a lot of injuries. I mean, they were supposed to have Anthony Richardson playing quarterback this whole year, and that hasn't happened after his injury. Yeah, so. True. Kind of torn here, but I, I I mean, it would be nice to see the Texans go to Indy and kind of upset all those Indianapolis Colts fans on my side as an AFC South <laughs> you know, rep. But, again, that means the Titans have to beat the Jags in order to help these teams, which is not completely out of the realm of possibilities. The Jags have not looked good recently at all. No. 
they are hobbling into the playoffs. Um, I do believe that even if one of these teams wins, I think they still make it in. Um, it's just a matter of the Texans. I'm sorry, the Texans, the Jaguars uh, having to lose in order to take the division. But I do think that whoever wins still gets in uh, as maybe a six, as the six or seven seat, depending on um, other people's standing. So I'm with you though, dude. I'm I'm going for the Texans, not necessarily for the same reasons. Obviously, I don't know if you remember this, and no, we haven't really talked about this before. You probably do, but we haven't mentioned this on the podcast. Before I became a Cardinals fan, yep. I was somewhat a Texans fan, and that was because I didn't really have a favorite team at the time, um, and they were an expansion team. I didn't really have any relation to anybody else, so I decided to jump on that bandwagon uh, with De- no Der- Derek, David, David Carr. David Carr. Sorry, yeah. I got a got a mixed up for a second, <laughs> and it just never really worked out. Um, they had good teams, and they've built something since then. But as soon as I switched over to the Cardinals, just a little bit closer to home and stuff like that, it's kind of uh, kind of been there. But you know, kind of rooting for the Texans mostly for C.J. Stroud again, hometown guy from here, SoCal. I believe he went to Rancho, so. Uh, I think it'd be really cool for them to kind of take it, especially like you were talking about on the road, going into on the road, yeah. rookie quarterback, rookie head coach, really digging their freaking franchise out of the dirt from last season. There's a reason why they had the, uh, I mean, I know they traded up for it, but there's a reason why they had that pick up top. So um, I think it'll be a good game. I'm glad that it's actually televised. That's the one thing that I wanted to kind of make sure. And obviously it's the one thing the NFL wanted to make sure by waiting for the week 18 schedule. So super excited. I know we talked about that last time. Super excited that they're doing that. Just really looking forward to this game, man. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be great. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And you know, I did, I do remember you being a Texans fan when they first came right? out. And it's funny because you and I both, even though it, we didn't like plan it or anything, we both happened to like pick new franchises or organizations to be fans of. I think even as we live in SoCal, we have the Dodgers and the Angels here. But when the Dimebacks started, we both kind of picked up on them in 98 and went for the ride. Mm-hmm. And then the next year was when the Titans went from the Oilers to the Titans and kind of rebranded. So I jumped on because, again, as kids growing up in L.A., we didn't have football teams. And I was definitely not going to be a Raiders fan at that time. No, so yeah, so that was we both kind of took advantage of not having a team in the local area and picking a new franchise or, like in my case, a revamped name and one uh, logo and just kind of jumping on ship and. Yeah, those Texans years first were really rough because I mean, I, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think if he might still own the record, they David Carr got sacked a lot that first year. I do too. think like, he owns the record. Yes, he I do just he they had no it. offensive line. They drafted a quarterback first overall instead of an offensive line and, and stuff to kind of build around. But yeah, that was rough in the early starts for them. But you know, they've kind of figured out. They had the JJ Watt years too, where they made the playoffs and even won a yeah. playoff game. You know, made some noise. And you know, again, I'm with you on the CJ Stroud thing. I mean. He's going to be in the discussions for Offensive Rookie Player of the Year, so it making the playoffs and makes Nico Ryan's as a Coach of the Year candidate even possibly. So just a lot of good things going down in Houston with that organization. And unfortunately, hopefully it's us and them for the next five to ten years battling back and forth as the Colts can go away. And you know maybe the Jags, even though they have Lawrence and Young, maybe they've already had their window and it kind of comes and goes. Which is kind of weird to uh, to think about because, like you said, the window is still – he's still so young. Uh, he mm-hmm. is in Trevor Lawrence. So if that window really is closed, that'd be pretty – that'd be something to talk about. Um, I don't I don't think it is. I do think that the Jags pull off the dub. I know that's what you're rooting for anyways. So I do think that the winner of this will get a wild card spot. Uh, but it's still going to be a great game, and it will set up for a good Sunday game for the Jags to kind of see, you know, all the pressure would be on them because one of these teams yeah. is going to win this game. I mean, well, technically, technically that's not true. I guess yeah, they, they could, could end it and then really screw things up. <laughs> <laughs> but more than likely, uh, one of these teams is going to end up winning this game, which will put the pressure on the Jags to make sure um, that they lock up the division with their own win on Sunday. So, And they're, they're in Jacksonville, too, I think. So all the pressure on them at home with their fans and everything. It's not like they're in Tennessee. It's the worst team in the division. No offense. No, it, hey, that's okay. Again, I'm trying to get this draft pick. So whatever whatever gets <laughs> us there, if we're the worst in the division, I want to be worst in the league at this point right now. So I think they're number six or seven in the draft at this moment. So could still drop a spot or two, depending on how things go this weekend. But, yeah, I'm definitely with you. I'm going for Houston. Um and then we'll see what Jacksonville does on Sunday against Tennessee. The Sunday night game is the other game that is really going to be electric, or one that we're hoping is going to be electric at least. Yeah. A lot of times these Bills-Dolphins games end up extremely one-sided. Uh, Josh Allen has an incredible record against Miami, um, and I, I personally don't think it's going to stop this weekend. 
I myself am rooting for the Dolphins, uh, but I do think that they are going to come up short. They've already secured a playoff spot. That's not necessarily what they should be fighting for. Um, a number two seed and a division win is obviously what they should be going for. They're at home, but I really don't know if it's going to matter. What do you think, man? I'm kind of with you there, dude. It, it, initially, I thought, okay, well, the Dolphins are at home. They should be in a better place. But then the biggest problem is is their injury report comes out the last day or so from their oh, practice. Yeah. Obviously, we know Bradley Chubb is out with the Achilles thing. Uh, Tyreek Hill has not part- – I mean, he had limited participation yesterday, but I think that was partially because he had to leave home and go home. Right. His house was on fire. That's a whole other thing. But thankfully, everybody's okay except for the house itself. But he didn't participate yeah. today, obviously taking care of some issues at home. Uh, Xavier and Howard didn't participate the last two days. Mozart still has not. Waddle has not. Uh, even A Chain, their backup running back, has been limited in practice. So their injury report's like 15 deep compared to Buffalo, who's got everybody fully participating except for Demar Hammond's limited. But again, Ham- Hammond's not playing like he was before <coughs> issue last year. So it's not yeah. like there's going to be probably anything to go there. So Buffalo's basically coming in, you know, fully healthy, ready to rock and roll, and they have all the momentum compared to the Dolphins. I know the Dolphins played yes. well against the Cowboys a couple weeks ago, but Last week against Baltimore on the road, they looked completely lost and out of control. And maybe even Baltimore gave Buffalo a little bit of a game plan of how to kind of slow down the Dolphins. And ever since, to be honest with you, the biggest thing is ever since the Bills fired their uh, offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey, and Joe Brady, the quarterback coach, has taken over, their offense has completely changed. They're much more balanced. The running attack has been a big part of why they're where they are right now with James Cook. Now, I know that hurts Stephon Diggs' numbers, but as a whole, as a team, they are playing much more balanced and much smarter on the offensive side, and their defense has always been solid. And again, if the Dolphins don't have any weapons for Tua, then it's going to be a long day in Miami for them. I don't know if the Bills' defense is going to do what Baltimore did to them, but the blueprint and the idea of it, I'm I'm with you. I, I can see that happening. Uh, the whole the whole Tyreek Hill thing that fire real quick that fire. Apparently, a kid was just playing with a lighter and lit his freaking mansion on fire, bro. That's nuts. Oh, is that's that what happened? Like that's I happened. never heard a story yeah, of what's that's what it I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it said at the bottom of ESPN today when I was working. I kind of have like ESPN and Fox Sports on the background, just kind of like listen to sports stuff. And I'm pretty sure that's what it said. One time I looked up, wow. I'm pretty sure it said just a kid started it with a lighter. So um, there's a lot of talk about that and uh, <laughs> because there's obviously some – allegations and i think there may have been charges pressed against tyreek for domestic things so uh, a lot of a lot of comments on the internet talking about that kind of stuff but yeah um one thing that i wanted to bring up i saw a quick video it was basically mike mcdaniels talking to tua as they're getting routed by the freaking uh ravens and he kind of looks at him he's like look man right now yeah we're getting our ass kicked for sure but what we don't want to do is take this and just be like because most things and most people, probably myself included, you might even be able to agree with this. When something's so bad that's happening, eventually it's like, you know what? Who cares? I don't even care anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care about this game. And he's like, no, 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 no. We need to care because this this matters. Let's take this. Let's harness this feeling. And let's go win the division next week. That's kind of how he he approaches to a, literally in the game that they're getting smashed. So. Hey. I know that he is not giving up on this. I know he wants to make sure that they win uh, the division. Uh, he is in McDaniels, at least. Uh, but, man, not having your personnel out in the field is going to make it a lot harder. It's already going to be hard if you have everybody. Not having all those weapons for Tua is going to be it's going to be difficult. Yeah, I unfortunately sure. don't see it happening. I'm hoping that they can keep it close since it's a Sunday night game. might be something interesting to watch, but that's unfortunately what we'll have to see. The other part, too, if you think about it, is even if the Dolphins were to lose, like you said, they've clinched a spot in the playoffs, so they're in regardless. But the, yeah. this is just bizarre to me. If Buffalo wins, they get the two seed. If they lose, they're not in the playoffs at all, even as a wild card. That has got to be the biggest differential from winning and losing in week 18 or week 17 at the time, whatever week we're talking about in the past, that you can either go from hosting two rounds of playoff games at home or not having a playoff game at all. That's just, that kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about it, but it is what it is. And I think, I'm with you, man. I think Buffalo feels better about themselves going into this game. They've played well the last, what, six to eight weeks. They've won in Kansas City. They won against Philly at Philly. Like, They've kind of done it all, and I feel like they're ready to rock and roll. And, yeah, if, if you're the Dolphins, too, like if you don't have all those guys healthy and ready to play and there's no weapons for Tua, which is the biggest thing that why they've been as good as they have this year, at least you get another week to get those guys hopefully healthy and get some of them back. I mean, obviously Chubb's not coming back, but no. Waddle and Mozart could be something that maybe come playoff wildcard weekend they could have them back, and it could kind of change the entire dynamic 
of that offense going forward. I'm not saying that's what you said, but I do think that the Bills need like one or two things also to happen if they were to lose. I think now, I think they're easy. Well, easier. I think they need Steelers. Uh, a Steeler win would kick them out and a Jags win. Well, the Steelers are playing now. Normally it would be a tough game against the Ravens, but the Ravens are sitting at completely everybody. And uh, the Jags are playing the Titans, which is the worst team in their own division. Um, so to your point, from here to gone is is definitely a possibility. So yeah. they're going to be going for for the gusto for sure, uh, and I think that they take it. So yeah, I'm with we'll you. see I on Sunday I night. I feel like oh, man, what a perfect game to pick for Sunday night too. And like you said, the, the Houston game on Saturday night being on its lonesome puts a lot of pressure on Houston or on Jacksonville, like we talked about. But this one right here, this is all the pressure on you guys. There's, the whole nation is watching as it's a standalone the last game, game of the year. It's the last game of the year because there's no more Monday nights. Nope. It's all on Buffalo. And hey, maybe next week we're talking about Josh Allen being like Jay Cutler again if they don't win. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if that happens, bro, I called it first. You said yep. it. <laughs> you said it a long time ago, and it took us a couple episodes to get it in there. But ever since we brought it up, it has not gone away. And it's something I can't stop and not let go out of my head. Yeah, he can't throw right now. I mean, okay, he can, but I'm saying he's not doing it well. They have, I think he has seven touchdowns over the past couple of weeks, but five of them are rushing. I think he's only thrown like two touchdowns. He's, his completion percentage is below average. His yards are below his average. Um, now, maybe that's because that rushing game is stepping up because obviously wins are happening. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not the same Josh Allen that we're used to seeing for sure. And maybe that's a good thing for them because I know that they don't necessarily like having to rely on having the savior take yeah. them to to the take them over the top in any sort of game. Uh, they want a more balanced attack, and uh, maybe that's what this new offensive style has for them. Yeah, no Bradley we'll Chubb on the other side for uh, Miami could definitely uh, help the Buffalo Bills running game too. So. Yeah. Right, right up the middle. It's a nice big gap now. Oh man, how that, how crazy is that? They shouldn't even have had Chubb in that late, and all that happens. But that's why they play the game. You never know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I agree. You, you can't just keep them out of the game. But to your point about the time frame of the game and how the game was so far gone, it uh, doesn't seem like it was really worth it. No, not at all. But the one game that. Again, we talked about these two games mean a lot. There's one game that, if you look at the two teams and their standing or the record. You think, why is this game important? But bu the Buccaneers going down to Carolina. Now, Carolina is terrible. 2-14. and 14. Yeah. We talked about David Tepper the other day getting fan mad at fans and throwing <laughs> drinks on them and all that stuff. But, I mean, the Bucs, who would have thought Baker Mayfield going down there would have them not only a chance at the playoffs, but winning the NFC South when we both picked New Orleans before the season started. We figured the Saints would have the easiest path to winning a division because everyone else was either really young and terrible or completely rebuilding. But here's Baker just proving people wrong, like always, it seems like. I thought the Bucks were going to come in third. I thought it was going to be Saints, Falcons, Bucks, and then Panthers. Obviously, the Panthers, they're, they're bad. They have a rookie quarterback, so there was going to be a little bit more of a struggle. But yeah, dude, this is kind of weird to see. Um, and But he's done well. He's done well with it. They have a lot of smart people in the building. They've obviously won a Super Bowl. So it's not like they don't know what they're doing. Um, a lot of their defense is still intact from when they made Super Bowl runs. Granted, a lot of the key players are a little bit older, but... Still very talented, obviously, but this one should be good. And the reason why we picked it is for a handful of reasons. If they win, they win the division and they're in. So no matter what happens with the Saints and the um, Falcons, they are in control of their own fate. They as in the Buccaneers. The other thing that we kind of wanted to add to it, and I'll break it down a little bit here, is Baker himself actually has a lot of incentives on the line with just this last game. I'll break a couple of them down, but he's got roughly $3.25 million sitting on the table for him Whoa. in darn near one week of play. Now, granted, it's an accumulation of season stuff, but it all comes down to this last one, okay? So he, he gets a million-dollar incentive as long as he plays 85% of the snaps this season. Well, he's currently at 99.7, so I right, think so that, that one's pretty much locked up. <laughs> yeah, you have to damn near sit every snap of the game, and that's not what they're looking for because they're looking for a win. So there's a million bucks. He gets another million dollars if they make the playoffs which is a dub. All they have to do is win in uh, Carolina on Sunday, and it's he's in, another million bucks. He also gets a quarter of a million dollars for being uh, having incentive, I'm sorry, $300,000 for any one of the incentives that he hits. He needs to be ranked top 10 in the NFL or top five in the NFC in a handful of statistical categories. These are the five that he has on his contract. Right now, he's at four of them. Oh, passer rating, touchdown passes, passing yards, and yards per attempt. 
He actually has hit in the top five or the top top five in the NFC or the top ten in the NFL in four of those. The one that he's not is completion percentage. Well, you know, he's a uh, throwing it everywhere. He's kind of say, a crazy he's more of a gunslinger, like they say. So, 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 but if he can if he can maintain top five and top ten in those, he has three point two five million dollars sitting on the line waiting for him at the end of this uh, weekend. So I know that he's going to want it. The other thing is, he mentioned in the interview. Oh, and we're playing Carolina. Oh, yeah. No, we gotta we gotta make sure that we beat the because obviously he had just played for them. Yeah, they said that. Year. Oh man, he's no good. We gotta get him out of here. He's not. He's the reason why. He's like, dude, you only won one more game than I did, and it's been a whole season now. Wow. So I know that he wants to have that revenge game. It's in Carolina. The problem is, bro, they won by three at home in Week 12, 21 to 18, and I'm pretty sure Bryce Young almost led a try a drive for a game tying field goal or a game winning touchdown and they just came up short so this isn't going to be a coast like you might think an eight and eight and two and 14 team might be these are all nfl players and they love playing upset especially for their own division rivals i was just gonna say yeah if you can ruin your own division opponents possibility of making the playoffs then yeah that's a huge motivating factor for them alone and you know even if they okay let's say the bucks win this game they get to host a playoff game in the first round which is great because every division winner gets to the problem is if they get there, they're going to face either the Cowboys or the Eagles, whoever doesn't win the NFC East. So you're going to have an 11 or 12 win team coming to your stadium. And especially if you get the Cowboys. Now the Cowboys don't play well on the road. That might go in your factor a little bit, depending on weather in Tampa Bay, Florida in January as well. But mm -hmm. I mean, just to get there and get these incentives for him. And if anything, Baker proves that he's a legit, I mean, he's not top five in the NFL as far as going to get you wins and take you to the Super Bowl, but he's no. a, a, definitely a serviceable you know, yeah serviceable quarterback can play the game knows what he's doing and if he has the right weapons around him including mike evans and some of the guys they have down there Dude. he's got an option i mean he did win a heisman trophy for a reason and i think the biggest thing for at least when he won the heisman is he had his swag man remember there's like i think it's yeah. the game at kansas when they wouldn't shake his hand and he starts clapping and then he's talking crap he's grabbing his uh, junk on the sideline just talking mm -hmm. shit the whole time so if he's got that kind of swag and this is a rivalry game or a, a what would you call it a uh, revenge game for him mm -hmm. he's gonna be stoked and ready to rock and roll and also if you're mike evans and the buccaneers like a lot of the guys that were there when they won the Super Bowl, not obviously the 50 man, three, 53 man roster changes all the time, but there are a, yeah. a couple core guys there. And Bowles, who the head coach is now, was the defensive coordinator back when they won. So there are some pieces and thoughts there to think that, hey, they might be able to figure this out and win this game and go to the playoffs. And again, if you get Philly, who's struggling even to come to your to Tampa Bay, possible. maybe you can sneak out a win. And then Baker looks real good and then <laughs> makes Carolina look even more dumb for letting him go in the first place and trading him last year. Well, not trading him. They just straight up cut him, and then he went to cut L.A. Him. But, yep. I mean, he went to L.A. and played with McVay and had that one game against the Raiders and looked like he knew what I he was doing. I remember that so game, maybe it's the coaching was the issue down in Carolina, which they hired Reich, and then we know how that went with Tepper, as we talked about the other day. Yeah, well, that wasn't, as we know, Reich's fault. Um, for <laughs> those of you, for, he did mention uh, David Tepper. If you missed what we're talking about, go check out the previous episode. Um and we actually have a video of him throwing said drink. You can kind of see not only the video but our breakdown of it too. What a what a guy! They find him. I kind of I kind of show you what that fine really means to him. Go check that yeah. previous episode out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he also he Baker gets a million bucks if they win a playoff game too. So if they are able to get in and they are able to get that you know struggling Eagles team. And they could just somehow miraculously pull off another win. Not only are they obviously advancing, which is something that nobody saw, well, really anybody in the NFC South, but especially the Bucks doing, um, gets gets the cash too. So it's yeah. uh, it's getting down to it. And I think the Bucks, I think they win this game. I think they barely win it. I don't think, because it's, again, division, on the road, hard-fought battle. But I do yeah. think they're able to kind of pull this off. They just have the better overall team. Um, and Baker seems driven. Yeah, I'm with you there, but I, I think it's actually going to be a bigger margin of victory for them than, yeah. than a close game. I just feel like, you know, Bryce Young and them, uh, so last week that Bryce was throwing tablets on the sideline, he's pissed off, yeah. and just which, I mean, you want somebody to be, obviously that means he cares and wants Care. to win, but I feel like Buccaneers are sitting there waiting, and Bowles and them, Bowles is a good defensive coordinator. He's had a lot of good teams in the past that he's been the coordinator for on the de defensive side, and I think that Cardinals, if they know the Panthers and how they were able to kind of exploit them the last time and make it a close game, I think this time the Bucks defense shows up and they go out. I don't think Bryce Young's going to have a good day at all, and I think they win by at least 10 or 14 points. I don't think it's going to be that close. Okay. 
All right, nice, nice. I just think Baker's gonna, you know, try to try to do too much, maybe a little bit. Maybe he instead of throwing two touchdowns, he throws one touchdown and one pick, kind of thing, kind of keep it close, you know. Again, if he's got his swagger pregame out on the field like he did when he was at Oklahoma, then I think he's gonna be in for a big day, and I think Mike Evans is gonna be a huge part of that. He's also a little bit hurt right now, so that's the only other thing. Baker, that's true. That's um, true. I believe he said that either – I mean, he's going to play regardless, right? But um, I believe they were talking about him being, you know, near 30 to 50%. The latest on the Bucks on, on their own website is basically that that he's looking good and there's optimism and encouraging signs. But um, that's what everybody says, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, right. no, he's definitely no, he's good he's now. Fine. Oh, yeah, he's, he's fine. Everything's great. No, no problem. Someone's going to come out and say, yeah, he feels like shit. His arm's on fire. He can't throw the ball. Like, nobody's going to do that, which exactly that always takes me back to hockey. I know this is a random uh, tangent, but the wow. hockey injury reports are the most frustrating thing in all sports. They say Why? lower body injury, upper body injury. That's all they say. They don't give oh, any just detail. Half, this half and that half. Yeah, which I understand because that game is such a brutal gladiator sport. You're constantly hitting each other, so you don't want somebody to know exactly what the spot is to possibly take advantage of it. True. God, as a fan, it's super annoying because every other sport tells you like the exact bone that is injured. But in hockey, like, oh, lower body. I'm like, what does that mean? Oh, lower body. That's all I can tell you. That's <laughs> You know, and it's it's funny because as much as it is, in my opinion, more violent because you're just constantly moving, plus you're on ice, which is hard and cold and slippery. Football is a violent sport, too. You can target people right? there as well. So, yeah, that's a good point. I wonder why they uh, I wonder why they do that. That's funny. Mm-hmm. That's funny that you see that because you, you pay attention to the hockey uh, – scorecards and yeah it's just, reports so much as like upper it's just so it. frustrating because i have i have staff members that are like you know when the season starts i have we usually have new staff and not all of them are necessarily sports fans or even hockey fans so they tend to ask a lot of questions because i make a hockey 101 pamphlet for all our staff to kind of learn the basics oh, of the yeah. sport because you're gonna have fans especially season ticket holders asking questions so you kind of want to at least be able to move the conversation forward not be a diehard and know everything so i've had staff members ask me like oh what does that mean lower body i'm like i don't know that just means half of his body something's wrong but they don't tell you what it is it's it's the most frustrating thing but again i understand from their perspective but as a fan it's so annoying (laughs) that's so funny um if we can continue with injuries, one of the injuries that happened really early in the season actually impacted your fantasy team Ugh, was so J.K. Dobbins. J.K. Dobbins went down. Um, I know that they – for the Ravens. I know that the Ravens have replaced him, obviously, with um, Gus Edwards, and they have Justice Hill, I believe, that are kind of hitting that tandem. But recently released Dalvin Cook from the Jets is apparently going to be signing with the Ravens, little bolster up the – roster heading into the playoffs with a nice downhill runner i i see zero problems with this and it kind of makes a lot of sense no yeah and i mean it's not like he played a lot in new york anyway so he's no he's he's fresh ready he's fresh and then there's no film on him within their system so if it's something he's played in before or has had time to kind of figure it out because he's going to have a whole week and then i mean also the ravens are going to have a bye week so it gives him a whole extra couple days to get to camp or well camp to practice Practice. and kind of get situated learn the system and what's going on could be one of those wild card games in the second round where or, I mean the division round where he kind of does some things that you don't expect because nobody really knows what to expect from him in their organ in their system. So something to think about. Yeah. I kind of like Dalvin Cook. I liked him when when he was in Minnesota. I, I maybe it's a fantasy bias because I, I tried to pick him <laughs> up a lot. Um because he he's a workhorse, bro. He he knows exactly what he's doing. I thought he was gonna be able to do something in New York. Obviously, it all really hinged on Aaron Rodgers. Um, and obviously it, uh, with Brees Hall's health, that it was more of a, a safety net in case Brees Hall, you know, needed a little bit more time coming back from his, uh, his season ending injury from last year. Uh, maybe they just wanted to kind of mix him up a little bit, but to your point, man, he, he barely played anything this season. Brees kind of took the main game as he should young dude. He deserves it yeah. too. Um, but that's great sign for the Ravens. They have literally a fresh pro bowl running back ready for prime for their for their really most likely deep playoff run yeah. love the signing i don't know where else he could have gone that would have been better to be honest with you yeah i don't think anywhere i mean descent maybe kansas city depending on pacheco mm-hmm. and how he's doing moving forward but yeah i think it's the perfect situation and again it's never a bad thing to have an extra running back in the stable because you never know what's going to happen the only thing that this is a random two topic but the rams and the kicker situation too bad there's not a kicker like this out there they could have signed before the playoffs here because they just brought Maher back, and that's going to be a mess if it comes down to a kick or anything for them when it goes to the playoffs. 
Yikes. Which sucks because I'm not a Rams fan, to be honest with you. Obviously, as a Cardinals fan, I don't root for them at all. But I don't not like them. And and for a team like that who who was able to kind of make the turnaround uh, when nobody saw it coming, myself included, uh, to make the playoffs, uh, I think it'd be kind of lame if you know some one of their games comes down to you know a missed kick or a mixed extra point or something like that when really the rest of the team is doing all they can to make sure that they either move on to the next round or at least keep the game that they're in really close so and i think it's kind of weird you know it's funny speaking of kickers when i was watching the actually i think it was did the rams play the giants last week yeah right yep yeah it was that game i was sitting here i was like gosh that guy looks familiar and he missed too i forgot i didn't know that yeah, I didn't know Mason Crosby was on the freaking Giants. I was like, damn, this guy's still kicking, like so, figuratively and literally, yeah, I guess. He he just signed with them, I think, the week prior. And not only that, two or three weeks prior to that, he was actually signed to the practice squad for the Rams because the Rams had, I can't remember their kicker they just cut in order to get Maher, but they were kind of teetering on him as well. So they brought Crosby in, and everyone was like, oh, well, they're going to cut the kid and go to Crosby. And then McVay was on uh, Mason Ireland. He comes on every week and just kind of like an update of what's going on. And they asked him about it. He said, yeah, well, it's just nice to have Crosby around and, you know, some veteran experience, this and that. And then they, they, he didn't really go into details like, okay, we're going to cut Haversek. That's the other kid's name. They didn't go into okay. detail about like we're going to cut Haversek or anything. It was like, we're just going to, you know, have him on the practice squad. And it was like, so you're keeping two kickers? But then Crosby never was on the active roster. And then they let him go. And then he ended up in New York. And I thought for sure when he went up to K, I was like, well, this is going to be the revenge. Like, you guys didn't want to sign me. I'm going to beat you. And then that didn't happen. And now the Rams are sitting pretty. I mean, they're going to end up in worst case, I think, as the six. But if they lose this weekend and some other things kind of bounce, I think it's Green Bay has to win. They could drop down to the seven and then have to go to Dallas or Philly in the first round. So, I would love for them to go to Detroit, though. We keep talking about it. I want to see Detroit have a host, a playoff game, and it'd be Matthew Stafford on the other side. <laughs> yeah, I ah, dang, that's funny that you say that because now that I think about it, I do want them to win that game, but I don't want Detroit to bow out in round one. Um, yeah, I know that, yeah, the Rams are sitting everybody. They're playing zero people. Aaron the Donald, only, rest, the only person Kyron Williams, rest, everybody is... rest. Puka Nakua because he's about 30 yards. yards away from the rookie record. And it sounds like the plan is get it to him quick, get him the record, and then get him off the field as well. So I, I have a feeling that'll be the case. And it'll be interesting too, not if, to see if they win necessarily, but to see how Carson Wentz looks out there. This is kind of like a tryout for him to kind of like Baker. Oh, last shit. Year Carson Wentz is on this team? Yeah, wow. He's there Ever, well, when they lost in Green Bay with Rippon or whatever at the quarterback, they cut him oh, the yeah. next day and they had a bye week. So they took some time. They brought Wentz in to kind of get an extra week to get the system down, and he's been on the sideline. So because they're not starting Matthew Stafford, which, again, totally understand. Obviously. Don't want to take any chances yep. with him. you got to need no. him standing up straight in order to have a chance in the playoffs. And anything, so this is yeah. his weekend, and I think, you know, again, it's a tryout for him. Like, if he plays well, and even if the Rams don't win, but he has a good game and they have a chance to win this game, maybe Wentz ends up on a roster next year. Because, again, we've seen how the backup quarterback situation has been crazy in the nfl with injuries so even if he's as a backup or in a battling in camp for something we'll see how he goes and see how he looks and what better roster to have it against i get that they're probably going to be sitting people as well but oh, what yeah. better roster to have your showcase game against than the niners Absolutely. Because, like, on the i road. just carved up arguably one of the best defenses yeah on the road that that that's that the NFL can place right now. I mean, obviously teams like the the chiefs are up there right now. Obviously the freaking Ravens just beat the shit out of everybody that they play. So that's another, that's another tough one, but yeah, that's actually a good point. I never thought about that like that. And but. if you think about it too, even it, not necessarily a tryout if for his career in general, but like if it works out well with the Rams and they, and Stafford comes back next year, if you're Wentz and nothing else open up, just stay in LA with the Rams. Cause uh, Stafford, the way he's aged and getting hit, he might miss three or four games next year anyway. Yeah. So you might still get some more playing time. And then if Stafford were to walk away and they kind of trust you with the system, maybe they go to you instead of going out. Cause I mean, I can't imagine if the Rams go into the playoffs, but even with Stafford next year, they're going to be, you know, drafting a quarterback very high. So maybe it gives Wentz an opportunity. I mean, Wentz is young, man. He's still got a shot. Last two things on, at least from my side. Um, I think Stafford having Stafford, I feel like gets hurt. You know what I feel like how he gets hurt a lot on his follow throughs, hitting someone's yep. helmet. Mm -hmm. I feel like he always gets hit on the hand somehow. And he has to miss, like you said, one or two games because yep. of a, he hit a helmet on a follow through or something like that. So perfect, perfect thing right there. Second thing is uh, this is going towards the game that they're in um, the, the, the Niners. What you, you you're going to sit them now, then you're going to sit them again. Cause you got to buy. And then yeah. you have, uh, another whole week 
until yeah, that's three weeks of you guys not playing. Yeah, and which which one is it? Rest or Rust? I saw a quick snippet from Kyle Shanahan that he says he does not like having two weeks off in a row. Um, as far as uh rhythm, obviously yeah. rest is helpful to, to for recovery for injuries, but as far as rhythm goes, he doesn't like having two weeks off in a row, and he's gonna have three. Interesting to see how the Niners will come back in there. I think they'll be fine depending on who they play. Uh, but the Rams, I think, are the one team that kind of could throw them for a loop. The Cowboys aren't going into San Fran to do much. I doubt the the Philly, not the Phillies. <laughs> I doubt the Eagles are going to fly into San Fran and do too much. I think the Rams kind of have that, you know, the McVay, um, Shanahan thing, division round. We play each other. We're not afraid of the stadium. You know, yeah. half of LA is going to be up there anyways. Oh, yeah. For they sure. don't travel as well as San Fran fans come down here, but. Um, but still, I don't I think, even uh, think it's the fact that the Niner fans travel well. They just all oh, live just here, here because the Rams were gone for so long. And in the 90s, that's when the Niners were at their best. I mean, the Niners and Cowboys dominated the early half of the 90s. So those fans are everywhere, especially in L.A. I mean, there's even Raider fans here and they weren't even here during the 90s. They left and went back to Oakland. So, yeah, but once a Raider fan, always Raider fan. Yeah, yeah. Man. and to you, know, you, mentioned, you mentioned rest versus rust for the Niners, but. The Ravens are doing the same thing. They're not playing a lot of people True. this week either. So True. How does that affect them? Usually it takes you a quarter to I don't know. I haven't heard an interview from Harbaugh about it, so that's why I didn't bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, no, that's a good point. Rust, a good point. rust thing and uh, usually takes you a quarter of things to get back in the swing of it and get your momentum or your your uh, vibe, but sometimes that could be too late by the time it's a playoff game. The other team's already coming off a win in the wild card weekend. They're feeling better about themselves. Maybe they get an early lead, and then it gets the pressure on you and the home crowd. So it'll be interesting to see how those two top seeds go. I mean, we talked about it, too. In baseball, the top seeds in, in the playoffs had that extra week off because of Oof. the first round, and a lot of them didn't even do very well. So no. even if you weren't a number one, maybe like if you were a Dodgers at a two seed or something. What happened right. to them? Oh, that's right. They got fucking swept. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Bye. All right. It'll always right. be just a feather in the cap to keep. <laughs> 100%. 100%. 100%. We're going to stay in the NFL, uh, and we're going to kind of stick with the theme of wrapping up the season. Week 18 games is obviously what we just discussed. And before we get into playoff predictions, Corey and I want to at least wait until the playoffs are set. We already gave you what the predictions were at the beginning of the season. If you've missed that, go check that out in one of our previous episodes. Maybe we'll try to link that in the description for you. Um, but what we would like to get into is awards. We predicted these ourselves. Um, so now we're going to kind of talk about where we all stand now that the awards are basically about to be handed out. We went through them one by one. I went through and just kind of picked out. They're kind of already kind of handed out depending on which award it is. But we'll start, uh, we'll start with the main one because there's not really much controversy around it. We talked about the, the Ravens and, and their dominance in the, in the NFL this season. So with MVP, because it seems to be an only quarterback award, it looks like Lamar is running, literally, away with this one. He's at the minus 20,000 as the betting odds. It's uh, pretty much wow. locked up for him. I was going to say, I'm surprised they didn't take it off the board like the Otani AOMVP votes back in the day. or the. Uh, well, the I mean, Vegas if you want to give them $20,000 for them to give you $100, I guess Vegas would take it, you know? Uh, man, that seems like <laughs> a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> But this was your prediction, man. This was your prediction at the beginning of the season. You had Lamar Jackson as MVP, and I mean, unless it's just unless somebody has the greatest game ever this week, it looks to be pretty much wrapped up. I would say congratulations, except I know we didn't put any money on it. But yeah. good pick, man. Good pick. Well, Still a good I, pick. And when we when we talked about MVP, I just had a feeling coming off of the contract situation, everything he was going to be out to prove. You know, new offensive coordinator, and even during camp when they were talking about how he feels much more comfortable in the system and he feels like he has more leeway to do whatever he wants when he gets to the line, I just thought that was going to, you know, show it out on the field. And so far it has. I know he's not top five in touchdowns necessarily as far as passing, but everything or else. Yards. Does, yeah, but everything else he does, like the threat of him on his legs and being able to run is what makes it so hard to plan for him. Because even if you play great defense on the back end with the safeties and corners and not allowing a pass, if the offensive line does his job and he finds an opening, he's going to make something happen out of it. And he's also really good about not taking a hit or a big hit at least and getting down when he needs to or out of bounds. So he's done a great job of keeping himself healthy. Again, he has this week off and then the bye week. So by the time they come to the playoffs, he should be healthy and ready to go and hopefully uh, hosting that MVP trophy on awards night on the Thursday night before the Super Bowl. That I believe he will. He's almost got it locked up. He's almost got it locked up. So great pick, man. Great pick. Good job. 
one of the few I had. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on to the next one, which we actually both picked. He's the favorite right now. We're going to go to Offensive Player of the Year. Christian McCaffrey is uh, the favorite right now with Tyreek Hill just slightly behind him and C.D. Lambs just slightly behind Tyreek. But both of them are at plus money, and uh, CMC is the only one. I think he's at like minus 400. So um, pretty much kind of locked up for him as well. I, I, there's not really much to argue, man. I wish Tyreek would have had a little bit better season to close because he started so hot. I wish him yep. and Tua, obviously he got a little bit of injury and, uh, and things like that. So it would have been kind of cool to see Tyreek – break the receiving record and be able to uh, maybe win offensive player of the year. But looks like this one's going to go to Christian. So we both picked that one. Not, yeah. Maybe it was a kind of a gimme, not too hard to predict that one. I mean, uh, just pick the guy who's going to score a lot of touchdowns. Oh, the running back in shot, um, not Sean McVay's <laughs> in uh, Kyle Shanahan system. Perfect. Sounds great. Uh, not just any running back. Of course, CMC is extremely talented. So thoughts. Right. It definitely helps with the system they run and the way they use him. Uh, I mean, he's him and Lamar are both Swiss Army knives of the position that they play. So it, again, we both picked him because it it just makes sense on paper that they were if their defense was as good as it normally is, and with all the weapons with Debo, or Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, and then even Kittle a little bit here and there, and mm-hmm. McCaffrey. I mean, they it's kind of hard to argue that fact. Yeah, that line is 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 really good, and even when that line breaks down, CMC out of the backfield on a dump pass from Purdy is is electric and and hard to stop. So the only other person who, in my opinion, is harder to stop is Tyreek, but uh, that's only because really his speed, not necessarily because of his elusiveness. I I wouldn't say he's the cut on dime like uh, Lashad McCoy used to be, but uh, Christian Christian could play, man. So Absolutely. that one seems to be pretty much locked up. Great pick to both of us, man. Huh? Heck yeah. And you know, you talked about trying to stop Christian McCaffrey. Defensive player of the year is a I mean, it's a three horse race at this point. I feel like I, yeah. I personally think it's gonna be Miles Garrett, but I could understand why Micah Parsons and TJ Watt again is in the running for another defensive player of the year. I mean, those three guys are just so good, but I think with the Browns having got ten wins already, even if they win this weekend get eleven. And then you got Garrett. Just that defense is just so good. I mean, the fact that they, I know they're not playing Flacco this weekend to keep them to safe for the playoffs because they yeah. had to clinch their spot and they're in their. Yeah, they have you know, no other options, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they're going to start their fifth quarterback for the regular season and they have almost, they're going to have 11 or 12 wins. Like, how could you not look at that defense and know that's the main reason why? And a big part of it is Garrett. I mean, even the fact that they have to double team him every, it's kind of like Aaron Donald in his prime with the Rams. Like, you yeah. have to double him every time and hope nobody else has a good day. But the rest of the defense is solid behind him. So as long as the Ravens, I mean, the Browns just, you know, stay healthy and do their thing this week and don't completely fall apart, I think Garrett is going to definitely get the award. Yeah, the, the normally the award, I feel like, it, at least recently, has seems to have been just give it to whoever leads the league in sacks, right? Yeah, true. Um, which is T.J. Watt. So how he's not kind of up a higher, I don't know whether to say that's good or whether to say that's bad. TJ Watt is an amazing player. Okay. But, but to your point, the whole, the whole, the whole Steelers defense is just, is, (laughs) is that unit. Now, granted, Cleveland obviously has a unit as well, but I really do believe it all really stems from Miles Garrett. And he's been there through the bad. Now we've been there through the throwing helmets at players. He's been there through a lot of other things. Um, but I do think that he'll probably kind of take away with it. The only other one that I would say, I like Micah, bro. I think Micah is very yeah. versatile. That's the one thing that I think Micah has over both of them is, in my opinion, Garrett and Watt are pass rushers, and that's it. Now, Garrett does stop the hole from the run in the middle, but TJ Watt, and again, not that he doesn't do anything else, but that's their, their only goal is to rush the passer, whereas Micah, dude, he's dropping back in coverage. He's picking up uh, running backs. He's also rushing the passer. Um, so I personally would love to give it to Micah. I, maybe I'm being biased cause I believe that's who I picked, but I think <laughs> that he actually kind of earned it throughout the season. He's sitting right now at 13 sacks, four back of TJ. Um, but he is only one back of miles Garrett. So, and I mean, Micah's I don't know. Gonna play this weekend cause they have something to play for too. So he could get another sack or two and end up passing Garrett in that stat. Very true. Very true. So it's uh it's good, but I I do think kind of what you're thinking. I think uh Miles Gay is that who you picked? Is that who you picked uh, to begin? Yep, I'm pretty sure I had Gary. So. Nice. So that's three for three so far for you. Damn, bro. Sheesh. Yeah, I'm having a okay, this is the case. <laughs> but I this know, is the one. Dude, the next like one it. is gonna be one we both had no pick of either of these two guys. I know no. I had 
Jordan Addison, which, you know, started out really well, but yeah. offensive rookie of the year is I think really a two, two person battle at this point going into this last weekend. Yeah, I agree. I think I had Zay Flowers from um, Baltimore because I was kind of piggybacking off of your, uh, you know, let's go with the Ravens are going to have a great year. And Zay Flowers did have a phenomenal first year. However, as a receiver alone, he didn't have the best year as a rookie. That one goes to Puka. And Puka Nakua Man. is, what, a couple yards short of setting the single season record? I think 20 That's or 29 for a rookie wide receiver, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Good for him, man. Um, came out of literally nowhere, played at BYU, drafted, I think, in the fifth round. Mm -hmm. So uh, fantastic. I mean, we've talked about this before, and this is why I think C.J. Stroud, who is the other offensive rookie candidate, um, deserves the nod. Two reasons. One, quarterback is harder to play, <laughs> especially for a team where you're the rookie. Uh, you just are so bad. I think they went 3-13-1 and one last year or 3-13. and 13, I don't know. Some, yeah. Something terrible last year. And um, and you're coming in and the, the entire weight of the organization is really on your shoulders. And he balled out. So that's number one is just the harder position. Number two, and this is what you and I have talked about a handful of times. Corey, who owns the regular season record for most receiving yards ever? Uh, Calvin Johnson, if I'm not mistaken. Calvin Johnson. And who was his quarterback when he did that? Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford. Okay. Now, just I think it was last year, maybe the, two, years ago, two years ago, there was this guy named Cooper Cup. He set, uh, he had a triple crown and received. Who was his quarterback when he did that? Matthew Stafford's pretty good at quarterback. That was Some Matthew Stafford. Oh, okay. Shoot. <laughs> so, Puka, so Puka Nakua. Now, granted, again, Puka's got to catch up. Puka's got to run. Puka's got to do all those things. I'm not saying he didn't put in the work, but it sounds like as long as you have Matt Stafford, you're going to be setting some sort of freaking receiving record. So, I'm going to take a little of that, take that with a little bit of grain of salt, and that's kind of why I think C.J. Stroud should get it. And currently, he is slated as the favorite. What are you thinking? I mean, I'm with you. The, the fact that he's a quarterback and came in into the league and did what he did. Not only that, I mean, he's an Ohio State quarterback. We talked about when he got drafted that Ohio State quarterbacks Ooh, don't true. tend to do very well once they get in the NFL, but he has definitely gone against that uh, rule that we've made up. And I think, <laughs> too, part of it, if you think about it, too, he already missed two games as well. And the fact that he has the, the Texans right there in a playoff hunt and a possibility of winning the division when, like you said, they were three wins last year. They bring a rookie coach to Miko Ryans. They have a rookie quarterback. A defensive rookie coach. And their offensive line is okay, and they had a couple weapons, but they even lost one of those Ooh. guys. Who was the guy that got hurt? Uh, like Exactly. No, it's – I mean, we didn't know the weapons before this season. Tank Bell and Nico Collins. and Okay, we knew, their, we knew their uh, running back, Damian Pierce. But other than that, there was really nobody. Oh, and they got – um Singletary is the other running back. The tight end. They got the tight end from the Cowboys. What's that guy's name? Uh, I don't know. I'll but the, anyways, the guy that, that was basically the, the Witten after Witten left for Dak. So, um, so yeah, I mean, they had that was pretty much the only person I knew on that entire roster, and he turned Tank Dell into a household name, and Nico Collins dropping 20 fantasy points a, a week. So um, good for him. Good for him. Yeah, again, and with D'Amico Ryans being a defensive like coordinator, you know, thought process as a head coach as a former linebacker, for them to have that kind of an offensive season with a rookie quarterback and you know, their defense is okay. It's not terrible, but it's not great. It's probably middle of the pack. If I had to look at the numbers, but yeah, yeah they're in every game and they're having a chance here. And CJ Stroud's a big part of that. Good for him. Good for him. We'll take it to the other side of the ball though. You know, we'll keep it with rookies. We're going to go with defensive rookie of the year. This is one that I got right. I got it right. <laughs> I, I think I picked this one. Yeah. This one wasn't really hard for me to pick either. The only thing that I, think was probably going to do it is if it's just an exceptional year by somebody else or an injury right now Jalen Carter for the Philadelphia Eagles is slated as the favorite with a close second of Will Anderson referring back to those Houston Texans that we were just talking about with CJ Stroud yeah, Will Anderson is solidifying that defense as a rookie uh, he is the leader him and CJ Stroud have come in as the young kids on this team but they are taking over and they are taking control so good for him for being up here he was the top pick top yeah, one of the top defensive picks I believe of the draft if not the top pick but Jalen Carter that Eagles that Eagles defensive line is just nothing to nothing to mess with I mean it's basically just Georgia all over again so he felt right at home he knew exactly what his job was going to be and uh, there's a reason why he's uh, slated to kind of win Yep, yeah, and my pick of Joey Porter Jr. did not age very well there either. <laughs> How is he doing this season, to be honest with you? I don't think that was a bad pick because in no, theory, but that's just, actually great. But I thought with T.J. Watt being on the line and, and causing a lot of issues up front that uh, Porter would be able to take advantage and get more interceptions and deflections and stuff since the quarterbacks would be kind of hurried. But 
I mean, mm-hmm. he's had an okay year. I haven't heard anybody say that he's been terrible. I just expected him True. to have a bigger year and be more impactful and then kind of be in the running for defensive rookie of the year. But, eh, you know, I got the first couple right that I, I picked, so I guess I can't get them all right. <laughs> I know, dude. You got freaking three in a row. And honestly, some of the harder ones, in my opinion, because rookies of the year, you can kind of just see, like, okay, who's going to be good? Uh, obviously, something like Puka and CJ Stroud having a crazy year could throw a wrench in it. But yeah. rookies are just like, okay, who's getting drafted high? But MVP, offensive player and defensive player all the year. Dude, you maybe should try to put some money on this. Man. <laughs> <sighs> we're going to keep it. We've got two awards left. Uh, we're going to save one that, in my opinion, is the most controversial, oddly, because most of the time this one is one of the least controversial awards and one of the ones that people pay attention to the least. Yeah. So we're going to save that one. We're going to go with coach of the year. There's really only one name that's kind of sticking out. The second one that was behind it, I would definitely give him a nod, but I understand why people would be – Kind of going here. Kevin Stefanski for the Cleveland Browns is the current yeah. favorite with D'Amico Ryans uh, for the Houston Texans as a very distant second. I, I, this is just because he's lost every quarterback that he's got and he got Joe Flacco off the couch and he still is like almost a 12 win team, right? Well, not only that, they lost, uh, was it Chubb, right? Early in the year to the knee injury. And Oh, so true. They, yeah, that was your player too. Yeah, I had a lot of injuries at running back early in the, in the fantasy year. Um, but yeah, they, they've done it. Like you said, they're going to have five quarterback start games by the time this weekend's over now that Flacco's out. I mean, you bring Flacco off the couch and, and kind of turn this into a whole thing. So it's hard to argue that Stefanski hasn't been able to keep that offense, keep moving and grooving without, you know, Deshaun, who you plan the whole system around. And, you know, yeah. Mari Cooper's been really good. Uh, they yes. have other njoku has been great, especially with Flacco. I feel like is completely open. Mm-hmm. Which, if you think about it, Flacco, those kind of style quarterbacks and young quarterbacks always need to have a tight end. That tends to be your favorite go-to option because at the end of the day, those guys are going to be your last option down the checklist. And yes. Njoku has had an absolutely great run with him at the quarterback position. So yeah, it's hard to argue with Stefanski getting. I mean, the Browns have ten wins and then the playoffs. Who would have? I mean, eleven. I didn't They're at eleven wins. The playoffs as a wild card. Oh, they have eleven already. I did pick yeah, them in the, the wild card spot, but I thought they were going to be having Deshaun Watson and be a completely different offensive, you know, system. But yeah, Joe Flacco and them have been great, and again, Stefanski's kept them battling, and here they are with a five seed and possibility of uh, making a run. I mean, Flacco did make a run as as the Super Bowl champ when he was in Baltimore. Maybe this is kind of a repeat of that. And all he needed was what a good defense, right? Yeah, exactly. And. Man. Browns have a top rated defense, defense no? <laughs> mm-hmm. Could be scary. Could be scary. He's got the experience over Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson has been in the playoffs, but he's not winning like Joe Flacco used to win, I which is so weird for me to say out loud. Technically, Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very true. Dang. That's the last time the Ravens were the top seed. The Titans went into Baltimore and beat them when we went to the AFC title game and ended up losing to uh, – actually, no, that wasn't the AFC title game. I think that was the Mariota run that we had when we beat them. But, yeah, so it'll be interesting. Again – Russ versus Russ when it comes to Lamar and them and sure. the when they get to the division round. Yeah, and like you said, all the pressure, man. You got all oh, yeah. the pressure. You're the one seed. You rested. You're at home. You're you got some MVP. lowly wild card winner coming. Yeah, most likely MVP. A lot of stuff kind of going, um, putting the pressure on you. We'll see how that reacts. But Kevin Stefanski should take it based on the betting odds. So congrats to you, my friend. Now, again, you brought up the controversial one that, you know, we have to talk about it because it is an award that we picked. And everyone's going to say DeMar Hamlin because obviously with what happened to him last year in Cincinnati and and the Monday night game and to be able to even come back and play or be on the squad is an amazing accomplishment as it is. But the Comeback Player of the Year award, I feel like we've had talked about this before. It means to be somebody that actually plays. He's only played, you know, a couple like kickoff returns or special team stuff. He's only got like two tackles. It's not like he's played very much or made a difference in any of the games. Um, So at the end of the day, I feel like Flacco and I mean, obviously Baker Mayfield has to be in that discussion as well. The way he's kind of brought Buccaneers into a possible playoff spot as well. But you know, Hamlin's going to be the discussion, but I'm with you on that. We've talked about this before. I get the whole, it's a great story. He's healthy. He's back and he's playing, but he didn't really play that much. So to be the comeback player of the year, there's gotta, there should be like another award that they create in a sense for, for people or him that have these situations where it's more injury related or obviously health scare, possible uh, death at that time. But I, yeah. he's going to be in the discussion just because of the fact that he made it back to the NFL and made it on the roster. I mean, I feel like it's just, they just, the, I don't know. The, the, yeah. the award is called comeback. Is it called comeback person of the year? Or is it called comeback player? I could have sworn it's called comeback player. Yeah, and in that right. case, you should probably have to play. 
Joe Flacco has already played so many more snaps, and he wasn't even on the team the whole the whole season. Yeah, he didn't I, get to what, I think this eight is, or nine. Yeah, yeah. I think this is extremely unfair. Not that Joe Flacco cares about the comeback player of the year award, no. but what is the point of having a player award if you don't have to play? Like if the if the reward if the award is just you have to have had something bad happen to you and then be on an NFL roster, well then call it that. Don't call it comeback player of the year because he didn't really play. Like you like you referenced, and I'll bring it up. He's he's been in or active for five games so far this season. In three of those games, he has recorded zero statistical anything, and in the other two, he has one tackle each. I mean, if that deserves a freaking award, bro, then sign me up. I, c- I might be able to do something. No, no, I know I couldn't. I'm not trying to be <laughs> ridiculous now, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, to me, it's just it's just not cool. It's not cool because it, it just kind of takes away from what the award actually is. You don't actually play. If you didn't play, why are you getting comeback player of the year? Yep, completely nah. agree. That's all I'm saying. So Again, it's a weird, but- <clears throat> you know, random situation that is not normal when it comes to stuff. And even for comeback player of the year, why are we not talking about even Tua being in that discussion after the year he had last yeah. year with the concussions and not getting through the season? He's basically played every game this year. He might have had a you know a couple tweaks here and there, but nothing major injury. He learned to fall with the jiu-jitsu stuff, and that has worked because here he is, and the Dolphins are out of the possibility of having the two seed. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think Tua. That's I think that's who I picked at the beginning of the season. Because mm-hmm. um, my question I think was, he's... is he going to be healthy? Yeah. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Luckily, yeah, he was able to kind of get through it, get through it. Well, we're going to kind of hedge it there on the NFL. Um, We've got plenty more to talk about, especially this upcoming episode on Monday, where we kind of go over what happened in Week 18. And next week, we'll start talking about our predictions for the actual playoff brackets as well. So make sure you kind of stay tuned for that. Um, We're going to stay in football. And we're going to move to what Monday night's game is. And no, Monday night football is not a thing. This is the college football playoff final. Michigan, Washington, in Houston. I know we talked about it a lot, about, but we haven't really picked on who we're picking, whether or not they're covering the spread, who's doing what. So we're going to kind of talk about it briefly here. I don't really have much to hide, so I'll go first. Go freaking blue. Yeah. Um, not a Washington hater at all. Love the Pac-12. Love a nice second place. Um, and if honestly, if Washington wins, that's fine too. But I am definitely rooting for Michigan. It'd be cool to kind of see J.J. McCarthy uh, really solidify the possible greatest Michigan quarterback ever and have uh, Harbaugh kind of ride out on the – with a nice sunset as opposed to, you know, kind of ending in that because it seems like he's pretty much going to the NFL. Yeah. I see the game. That's who I'm rooting for. Who are you rooting for? I mean, I kind of am rooting for Washington. Besides a good just, game. Yeah, well, yeah, I definitely want a good game. And if we have anything like we had in the two semi-games, we're definitely going to have a good game. But, yeah, I'm yes. kind of rooting for Washington just because, I don't know, Michigan is – everybody else is either – you're either rooting for Michigan because you love them or everyone in the country hates them because of all the issues that have come up with this year and Harbaugh being suspended. But I think it would just be funny for the Pac-12 to dismantle, and the last year that it exists, they have a Pac-12 team that wins the whole thing. <laughs> so I'm kind of going. It for would that. be pretty cool. And uh, I, I mean, Penix has just been great the last couple of weeks, and getting into this point. I mean, really all season, obviously, he was a Heisman candidate uh, as well. So mm-hmm. I hope, kind of want Washington to win, but I, I'm not going to be mad if Michigan wins because I'm with you there. I think Harbaugh going off into the sunset, winning the title. He's already hired an agent that represents NFL players and coaches. So. The writing's on the wall as far as him leaving after this is over. So why not, since he didn't get the Super Bowl shot title when he was in San Francisco, and I know Stanford was really good when he was there with Andrew Luck, but they never won a national title and got into the game. Nah. So it'd be cool yeah. to see him win it. And then, like you said, the khakis move on back to the NFL. <laughs> um, I think it, I think it's going to be close. I think, you know what's crazy? If you think about it, like, this is just a Big Ten championship. Yeah, you're right. Because the Washington right? be a part that's where Washington is going next year. Too. So <laughs> it's just basically two Big Ten teams fighting for the national championship. SEC who? S- what? SEC what? Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah, uh, I like the SEC. I'm not trying to be a hater, but uh, it's nice to see some a different school besides an SEC school needing to be in um, the the final game of the college football season. So I think the spread is four and a half. Um, I don't think it's going to be 
I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be a touchdown or less. That's why I think the four and a half is pretty good. Uh, like 27, 20 is what Michigan won by. Uh, I think Washington won by six. So it's, they were all within one touchdown. I think it's I'm hoping, I think it's going to be that close as well. I'm going to say Michigan doesn't cover. I say they win by a field goal. Okay. All right. Yeah, it'll definitely be close. I'm with you. I feel like especially because Washington, I mean, they're both teams are coming into this game 14 and 0. Washington had eight games that were decided by one score or less. So I don't expect them to run away with it. And Michigan, you know, the only problem is I feel like it, they only each get one week to prepare, prepare compared to the like 30 days they had to prepare for the semifinals. I feel like you should get an right. extra couple yeah, days true. or at least another week to get ready for this one. But yeah, I'm with you. I think it's going to be close. I think it comes down the wire. I just, for some reason, I'm just, I feel about Penix, man. It's kind of, he had, like somebody mentioned it the other day. I think it might've been John Ireland. When I was listening to Mason Ireland. He kind of has like that Joe Burrow vibe where he's just, everything he yes. throws drops in the right place. They've been, to, a lot of those guys have been there for a few years and they've built this system together. I know DeBoer, DeBoer their coach has only been there too, but the rest of the guys, Penix and them have been there at least two or three years and kind of have a thing going. I just, for some reason, got this weird feeling that they're, they're going to somehow show up and get a win. And it might be, you know, they might be down three and then drive down and then get a touchdown instead of end up getting the field goal because they get some big play at the end and then Michigan's trying mm-hmm. to, you know, get back down and try to force it. I just feel like, I don't know, I just got this weird feeling Washington's going to somehow figure it out and get a way to win. That'd be cool with me too. Again, I'm rooting for I'm rooting for Michigan, but if Washington wins, then hey, good for them. I know that uh, that's the one. Once all four schools were were picked by the College Football Playoff Committee, I believe that was the one with the longest shot to win, even though they were the technical two seed in all of it. So, yep. um, it'd be kind of cool to see. They got it right though. They really didn't get it right. Yeah, the committee kind of knows what they're doing. I guess. Well, at least for this year, next Finally. year be twelve teams with a whole another whole another can of worms. We'll look That's going to be one. something else, bro. Jeez, <laughs> talk about that. Our show's going to be insane for those coverages. <laughs> my goodness, there's going to be so many games to go over. Because if they were anything like the games this year, oh my gosh. Yep. Very absolutely. good. Absolutely. Let's move on though from football. We've been talking about it a lot lately. In fact, that's what our entire episode last uh, on Tuesday was. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, you can find us on YouTube. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, we cover week uh, 17, week 18 coming up, and all deep coverage in the college football playoff games from last week. But switching over to basketball, let's start with some cool history, although it's not necessarily Lakers history. It kind of is in a little bit. Big Shaq Diesel, huh? getting his number retired in Orlando. You kind of, yeah. you, sh- you told me about this today. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, he just found out today on the uh, TNT pregame. So I guess earlier in October, November, I don't remember what podcast he was on, but somebody asked him about, you know, do you think you should have your number retired? He'd be like, yeah, I'd love to be the first one because obviously the franchise was started very early, uh, a couple years before I got there. And then while he was there, they went to the NBA Finals. And obviously they've been back since with Dwight Howard. But, I mean, that team with him and Penny Hardaway was absolutely amazing. Dennis Scott at the – and then you had Scott Skiles playing point guard. Like they had a really good team and a good run there. And, you know, for him to be the first one to have his number retired, and I have to look at it too. How many guys have their number retired in multiple cities? And obviously Shaq is now going to be a part of that list because I don't think his jersey's going up. I don't know if they retired his number in Miami either. I'd have to look at that too because he did win a title. They retired Jordan's number. Who knows? Yeah, Yeah, true. Very good point. But, yeah, to see number 32 retired up in uh, Orlando, I think they're going to do the ceremony in February sometime. I don't remember the date of the game, but it's coming up soon. And, yeah, it'll be fun to see. I mean, I – Shaq's always a bundle of joy and, and fun to watch. So I'm sure he'll have a great speech and how his early years and how him and Penny should have stayed together. And it'll all be kind of like when him and Kobe kind of talked about that stuff after they retired as well. But yeah, I mean, good for Shaq, man. And just, I don't see how I'm surprised it took this long. I don't know why it took so long for them to get to the point of wanting to put it up in the rafters. Yeah. I don't know what the time frame is that people are looking at, uh, but this is the first one for them. Oddly enough, they aren't the last franchise to, not have a jersey number retired. There's still two out there. Do you know who they are? Two teams that don't have a number retired. Wow, that's only two? Even like yeah. Charlotte has a team with a number retired? Yeah, that's apparently. Crazy. Maybe Michael retired his own jersey in Charlotte. I mean, that's too. definitely possible. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. He buys the team like, hey, retired my number. I didn't play here. Yeah, can't cares? play 23. Thanks, bye. <laughs> okay, if I had to guess off the top of my head, the only one I can think of would be the Clippers because they haven't ever done anything until the last couple of years. So that's my that's That my is guess. correct. So it is the Toronto Raptors and the Los Angeles uh, Paperclips. Wow. I mean, Clippers. Um, Even yeah. Toronto? Huh. 
Bro, just, that's what I was – when I saw this, I was like, how the fuck is Vince Carter not retired there? I'm not saying that he's one of the best players of all time. I'm just saying he's one of the best players of all time for the Toronto Raptors. Yeah, like, no, absolutely. There's not that many and people who have done much more. No, he, he didn't bring what, a championship. 20 tell me who did. He played 22 seasons overall, I believe, right? That was when he, when he yeah. retired. And I think he played seven of them in Toronto and obviously winning the dunk contest there. Well, not in Toronto, but as a Toronto Raptor. As and a giving – Putting the Raptors really on the map at that time because before him they didn't really have anybody good that nobody even knew you know half of the guys on their roster, um, but he definitely put him on the map at that time when he had the dunk contest and everything going on. Mm-hmm. And again, twenty two years and a really good career for a lot of it. And he became a three point shooter after he kind of lost a lot of his jump. Not that he didn't have still some dunks in him, but yeah, you know hot. you kind of have to evolve your game as you get older. And yeah, I'm surprised that he's not retired up there. But I mean, he does have the highest points per game played in a Raptors jersey at twenty three. No way. Um, oh, what the heck. I, I think the other thing, though, is the first number they'll be retired probably up there would be DeMar DeRozan. I think he owns, like, basically every team record at this point. So mm, he'll probably like total be the first one retired. Probably. Yeah, like, I'm looking at now. Okay, career leaders for the Raptors. Most games, DeMar DeRozan. Minutes played, DeMar DeRozan. Field goals. Field goals attempted. Two-point field goals. Three-point field goals. Oh, no, that Kyle Lowry's on the three-point. But yeah, I was going to say Kyle Lowry. DeRozan's like, everywhere. It's in, And then Bosch is more on the defensive side. So true. you got to think and that at some point, you know, DeMar DeRozan, especially because – DeMar's a scorer and has continued to play well once he left there. And it's not like he left like he didn't want to be there. He was traded no. for Kawhi Leonard. So right. Who then brought a championship to the season or to yeah. the city. So and we were yeah, talking about cool. it before when we were prepping how Loff was saying, well, they should retire Kawhi. I'm like, man, I don't think they're gonna retire his number. He only played one year. Not that he didn't do a, a great thing the year he was there. Of he course. Was just a statue to like especially that shot that bounced off the rim eight times against Philly. Maybe you could do a statue or something or, or the best thing would be, I think Lav talked about it, how you could like somehow retire his laugh when he was there. Maybe the statue outside has like a voice box in it and plays. The uh, over. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Lav. Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, and then again, the other one is the Clippers. Uh, who cares? Chris Paul could be there, I guess. Blake Griffin could be there, I guess. Um, the, the, what the Clippers on, I mean, need to do when they move into into a dome next season is the first thing they need to do is put a banner up for Ralph Lawler. That's what they need to do because Lawler was the announcer for them forever, just like Chick Hearn. I believe mm. the media entrance right now at Crypto is the Ralph Lawler like entryway. But once they leave that stadium and no longer playing there, I would assume that name will get changed. And if you're the Clippers, the first thing you should do is hang a banner up with a microphone for Lawler, especially because he's still here right now. I know he's not p- working for the team, but he's still alive, and I think. Having that opportunity the in the new stadium, if even if not even the first night of the new stadium, like break it open with him, yeah. you know, Lawler's law, get to 90, it was a 97 or 100, first team to 100 always wins the game was like his weird law that he went by. So I think that's 97 weird. was David Yada's. Oh, yeah, that's shout right. Out to David, Yada. David Yada. Wow. Shout out, David, if you're listening on, on Japan. Um, <laughs> but yeah, dude, that I think that'd be the first thing they do is retire a microphone before they put a number up there, unfortunately. That'd be pretty cool. I could see that. Just real quick, I still remember that to this oh, day every I, time i see time. i'm like oh 97 oh, maybe let's see if they're gonna win let's see the first two to the 97. Time. not to get past 97 to no, hit 97. 97 yep if you score 97 first you're gonna win the game that was like the weirdest rule that he came up with but hey he was right a lot of the time so it i worked a lot yeah i worked more it. often than not it was right yeah true true it's kind of funny yeah shout out david shout out david <laughs> Uh, speaking of more people that are retiring, like that uh, uh, the announcer who is is not 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 no longer with us, as in on the earth, but no longer with them, as in in the booth. Ricky Rubio decided to call it quits today. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of didn't know. I thought he already called it quits, but I props mean, to props to Ricky. Yeah, he had a great career, but it's one of those two. I think because he hasn't played in a year, and, the, and we all just kind of assumed that he was done playing. So this is just the official like. I'm retiring. Don't call me anymore and expect me to, you know, try to suit up or anything. But yeah, and Rubio was great. I mean, he had a good run yeah. in uh, Minnesota. And then when he went to Utah, you thought that was going to be like the spot for him. And then he got injured and he was never really the same after that. But I remember him being, if you think about it, he was kind of like the first Luca. He was a point guard. He was really young as a kid playing over in Spain. Everyone talked mm-hmm. about him, how good he was. And when he first yeah. came here, he was great. But, you know, ultimately the injuries took their toll on him and he was never able to get very far or win anything. But yeah, he was a lot of fun to watch for sure. Dude was playing professional basketball since he was 14 years old. So, exactly. um, yeah, I mean, guy, guy can play. Yeah, regardless of what you think, led a, a lot of the Spanish teams um, in all the FIBA Cups and the Olympics and stuff like that. He was definitely on on them when they were facing, you know, the the comeback, not the comeback, what are they called? The Redeem Team. Redeem I was like, team, yeah. yeah, so against like Kobe and with Powell and stuff like that. So he was on those teams. Um, great, great player. Good for him. Good for yep, him. Absolutely. 
some other random NBA news that we're going to kind of just kind of roll through here. Just topics. Obviously, it's in the heart of the season. The in-season tournament's over. Um, and just really kind of just stacking up wins or losses, depending on the team. <laughs> Bucks, great team. Ten losses on the season. Four of them all to the Pacers. They cannot seem to beat. I mean, I get that they have the highest rated offense in the league, but damn. That is nothing. Bizarre. Not one time can you be this 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 in um, in conference rival. Ugh, that's a rough look for for the Bucks. Now it is, and you know we talked about when they made the Lillard trade that their defense was going to take a hit, and obviously that is the case against Indiana. But yes, also they probably won't face Indiana in the playoffs. At least you got to hope they won't, because that could uh, be the Achilles heel for the for the Bucks. But seems it. You know, it's a division opponent. You know each other well, and then obviously going into that tournament, and then the whole stealing of the ball situation that wasn't stolen and all that crap that became part of it. I think the Pacers are kind of in their head and maybe that's part of the reason they've lost four times of them already. But if you're Milwaukee, you're worried about bigger things than just losing a couple games to the Pacers. And if you've lost 10 and four of them to them, you only play them four or five times total. So continue mm-hmm. just doing your thing and dominating the rest of the league. Uh, speaking of in the head, it's definitely in their head. Have you seen that interview with, uh, with Giannis? No. What was the latest thing on that? Let's roll it real quick. I'll show you. Uh, now we, I think we realize as a team that this, this team's out there that can beat us four times in a row. Not in a row, sorry, four times in the season. You know, now you you have that uh, and you think about it. Now when you go back home and you sleep and you wake up, you think about it. Now when you go back and uh, work out, you think about it. In the All-Star break when you're going to be in an uh, exotic uh, beach with your family, I hope you think about it. You know, when you're about to get freaky at night, you think about it. <laughs> you know, um, but at the end of the day, it's good because now it gives us time to fix things. Uh, <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> what? I love this dude, bro. He's just, I, I guess he's being honest, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's nothing but honest a lot of the time. I mean, it's what got him here and why we all love him. And he's just a funny, you know, dude. I, I just... That's a lot of thinking about the Pacers. I think that's the last thing I'd be thinking about is the Indiana Pacers. But that's what well, it is, I, I mean, guess. Hey. <laughs> yeah, apparently, apparently. <sighs> One thing that we all need to think about, especially as Laker fans, is what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Um, we, I, dude, we can't catch a break. We're slipping. We're what three and eight now, or something like that, since the so. in-season tournament win. Mm-hmm. Three and nine, maybe I think after the Miami loss, it is it, dude. I, I don't even know anymore. I mean, uh, the rotations are weird. The starting lineups are awkward. I get injuries are a thing, but we have LeBron James and Anthony Davis, and they're doing well. Yeah, LeBron is dropping thirties, ads dropping double doubles every night, and I'm talking in the teens of rebounds yep. and in the twenties of points. And we're still we lost by like twenty to the freaking Heat at home the other night. I would, I don't know, I don't know, dude, I don't know. It's just. Yeah, it's so frustrating to watch. If I would have told you after 35 games, LeBron and AD have only missed a combined five games, I would think, oh, they're only probably like 20 and 15 at least, maybe 22 yeah. and 13. But here they're at 17 and eight. Oh, they're actually 36 games. Or no, 35. 17 and 18. Under. Yeah, it's one game under. But also, if you think about it, looking back to at the in season tournament, like when they want to play and they are like engaged, they're really good. So it's almost one of those like. You know, last year we kind of lackadaisically got through the regular season. We made the playoffs, and then we turned it on, and we were able to get to the conference finals. Maybe that kind of is hurting them now with that thought process. But I'm with yeah, you on I the rotations. So. Um, the injuries has not helped as part of those rotations because we keep having to change the starting lineup, which then changes everything else from there. Um, I know there's talk of, like, there's a disconnection between the coaching staff and the team. Yes. Um, I mean, LeBron didn't do media last night after the game, which with him out, without him saying a word says a lot that he's obviously it's frustrated. Um, they're definitely going to have to do something at the trade deadline. Uh, you know, even though they got Vanderbilt on this nice uh, extension that he's worth, but, you know, and, and the Gabe Vincent thing hasn't panned out as well. Obviously, we know that. Trade him. But the d deal is decent and easily to be traded, so there's going to be some movement. They're going to do something. I don't know if you fire him or not. Maybe you do something at the deadline and you fire him, know, but dude. at that point, who do you have take over? Who's on the coaching staff? So there's a lot of questions there, but at the end of the day, it's LeBron and AD, and they're doing great. So if they can just get one or two guys that can actually be maybe make some threes and stretch the floor out and unclog the paint for them to do work, because like you said, if they had been, if they had twenty to twenty five wins right now and they're above five hundred and kind of playing better, 
AD's probably in MVP discussions with what he's doing on the floor because he hasn't missed very many games. And besides that bad half against Denver and then maybe missing the second half against Miami because of the back tweak, he hasn't really had a lot of bad games. There hasn't been many games of like, where is AD at today? There's been very few, if any of those. So it is kind of confusing and frustrating, but also, you know, no. they're 17, 18, the best team in the West has 24 wins. So it's not like they're comp- like, I think last night when the game started, I noticed that said the standings for Miami, their record was 19 and something and Lakers 17 and 17. The Lakers are 10th in the West. Miami was fourth in the East. So the West is just a gauntlet of really good teams. And a lot of those teams yeah. like OKC and Minnesota are younger, have some younger legs and guys are playing well. And when it comes to Minnesota, especially Anthony Edwards played really well in the FIBA tournament. And that has kind of really carried over to him playing this year playing really well. I think that kind of opened so did up Austin Reeves. What the hell? Well, yeah, the Reeves thing is, is confusing. Cause and and the Rui thing, when he is healthy, they feel like they need to play him more and they're not. So again, yes. it's a lot of questionable calls. And even last night after the game, you had AD saying like, we didn't play hard. They out hustled us. They out rebounded. I mean, everything they did better than us. We just didn't deserve to win tonight. And then you have Austin saying, yeah, we're frustrated here. Like nobody hates each other, but we're, yeah, we're frustrated. We're losing. Of course we're mad and upset. Like we don't want to really lose that. But then Darvin Hand comes out and says, like, oh, well, you know, we're not healthy. We have injury. Well, everybody has injuries and issues. I know there's more so for, for them than most. But at the end of the day, everyone's got to have an issue or an injury at some point to deal with. You've got to figure out a way to get through it. And the biggest issue is not coming out ready to play from the get-go. They, every first quarter, they're down 10 to 12 points, it seems like, almost yes. every night. Yeah. And they have to spend all this energy just to get back in it by the fourth quarter. And then they run out of energy, and that's when they end up losing the game. So. A lot of questionable things there. I mean, Christian Wood hasn't played nearly as much as I had anticipated. Jackson Hayes has not played very well, even when he does play a little amount of minutes. So, again, Jackson Hayes is another one. I wouldn't be shocked if he's part of a deal at the deadline to kind of get some more pieces. I think they need another real, legit, beefy kind of center who can do some work down there and get some rebounds. I think they need at least one, if not two more shooters. Torian Prince had a terrible game yesterday, but overall Prince has been pretty good overall for the years, especially shooting for three. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's really annoying and frustrating at right now to, to watch for sure. And I don't really know whether or not to blame him or not. I'm not on the bad wagon of fire ham immediately, but I'm under the bandwagon of like light a fire under ham's ass because yes. it's something is off. Figure something out. Can we get a starting lineup? Can we get like, and, and why? Okay. Everybody, like you said, everybody has to deal with injuries. Why the fuck are the Lakers always so injured, bro? Do we have like the worst medical staff? Do we have the fucking, we live in fucking LA, man. (laughs) You ain't got to go out through the snow and shit, bro. We got, we got the, we got kale smoothies on every court. Like what? (laughs) what? We got the best nutrition arguably in the country here. And we're always the most hurt. I don't fucking get it, bro. It's so frustrating to see. And it's not just because we're old, because it's not just our old people. Our oldest players are the ones that are playing. Yeah. Very true. So, uh, it's just, it's just all, it's a bunch of young people. That, I don't know. I don't know, dude. It's, I don't get it's, it. I don't get it. The other thing too, is if you think about it, a lot of guys <laughs> that are, that we have, the Lakers have brought in the last even 10, 15, even more than that, that are shooters outside of get before they get here. They're like great three point shooters. Like, cool. Then they'll fit in perfectly. Once they get no. here, it's like they lose Trash. their shot. I don't know if it's because of the pressure of playing with LeBron and or the bright lights it, of LA. Well, I mean, they always for the LA part, but the LeBron part, I think would be bigger because even Cleveland had some of those issues when he was there the second time, True. you know, they'd bring these guys in and then they wouldn't play as well. And then they trade them and get somebody else that would. So mm-hmm. there's a little bit of that involved too. And, you know, I don't know, but Le- again, LeBron not doing media speaks a lot of what the frustration is in that locker room. So hopefully that is a sign of things maybe starting to figure it out. And they, they better, I mean, they're going to play Memphis tomorrow. And with John Morant back, that's not an easy feat. Like it was the last time they were here. And then you got it's the Clippers hell. you're hosting on Sunday, who obviously that's are very hot. Definite everyone's hell. talking about. So, they better figure it out over the weekend and get some things going. Cause this is the biggest month I think as far as home stands for them, they only have, I think it's two road games in the first like three weeks of the, of the month. And two, one of those is at the Clippers. The other one's at Utah. So you're not traveling very much this month. You have to take advantage. And yeah. Like 18 of 20 games this month are at home or something. Yeah. Like that. Because in February when the Grammy awards come back to town, there's going to be another long road trip. So you got to take advantage of the home cooking while you have it. And hopefully they can do that over the next week or two. Cause otherwise I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if there's a dead a trade by them way earlier than the deadline of February eighth. I mean, when they did the trade last year for Rui, that was like two weeks prior to the uh, deadline. So I wouldn't be shocked if they do something similar to that this year. We'll see. It's we'll frustrating. See. I know. <laughs> One thing that we're yeah yeah. One thing that we're not doing is something that happened for the first time in NBA history last night. 
five teams across the slate of NBA games scored over 140 points. And I only think one or two of them was in overtime. I think most of them were in regulation. Lafayette and I were talking about this last night. Who, like, when does this stop? Is the soon Jordan played and it was like 80s, maybe 90s. Then, the uh, you know, the Kobe years, it was like 90s, maybe early 100s. Now we're scoring 100 and fo- this is going to be two. This is an all star game. It's 200 to 210 at the end of the, like, this is, I don't you know, know what? I, I understand I that scoring is exciting, but defense is, is fun too. From my perspective, I feel like it's almost like watching a video game version of NBA, which is why. I don't like to play online uh, in the first place with NBA 2K because a lot of it is run up and down, run up and down, run up and down, and just shoot. And uh, someone who grew up watching the basketball you're talking about and playing basketball a lot, I like to run an offense, a pick and roll, mm-hmm. have a have a plan and what's going to happen. So if you take more time off the shot clock and you end up winning, who cares what the final score numbers are? But today's game, I mean, if we think about it, we can blame it on the seven seconds or less suns. I was Dan just about Tony. to say, has everybody implemented D'Antoni's system? <laughs> I mean, essentially it's it's three i mean more, more, i think john island was talking about this back in the day i think jim mora the coach of you know the playoffs he said that what? in the nfl the one stat he had to look at and know who probably won the game more often than not was the turnover battle mm-hmm. and now in the nba if you can look at one stat and see who probably won the game or not it's who had the most three threes, who had who shot the best three per, three point percentage yep. in the game and that's kind mm-hmm. of reigning true there's more and more shooters but unfortunately not there's a lot of steph curry NBA. <laughs> I'm yeah, just kidding. I like that situation stuff. either. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's just not that fun to me, bro. Like, I, I scoring is fun. Don't get me wrong. But so is like good defense. It's that there's a real. I do not. I do not watch the All Star games. I watch the three point. I try to dabble with the dunk contest. Maybe I'll see the skills position or the celebrity game. The world, the world, you know, versus U.S. is basically an all-star game of that, of kids. And then the actual all-star game is just a layup line. It's a layup and three-point line, and it's, the, it's not fun to me. That's not fun basketball. It's just whoever can hopefully make the most shots without playing any defense, and that's just stupid. I just yep. don't like it. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I, I bring the hand check back. <laughs> And you know, you that's mentioned my, that's like, my vote. Steph Curry obviously is a big part of the way the game changed. I mean, speaking of Steph and the Warriors, there's talk of Draymond coming back soon. Uh, I don't know. There's not an official date out there, obviously, but even last no. week, I think when we talked about it, there's talk of mid to late January. We're here on the fourth. They're talking about a week or two here coming shortly. Uh, I would think he'll get back into the you know the building first and kind of have a couple practices and make sure he's you know feeling good before they throw him out on the court, obviously. But it like it'll be punch somebody or something. Or... <laughs> It'll be oh, interesting sorry, yeah. to see when he gets back, uh, you know, how he kind of takes his um, actions out on the floor moving forward. I mean, I'm still expecting him to be kind of demonstrative and like his thing, but hopefully it'll be kind of a step back and after he's gotten some help and maybe not try to sell the, the calls as much with your hands and accidentally punch people moving forward would be nice too. <laughs> yeah, that game tonight actually came down to the wire. Nuggets pulled it off 130, 127. Wow. I wanted to go and look, and I'm trying to see when the next time. Oh, February 10th, the Phoenix Suns come to Golden State. That's oh, going hey. to be an interesting game. They'll be back before then for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. So that should be uh, that should be somewhat interesting to see how. Like I wonder, does he just like go dab him up? My like, oh my bad dog, and hopefully like Nurkic doesn't turn around and like just fear for <laughs> flinch for getting punched in the face or something. But I don't know. It'll be good to have him back. I mean, I, I'm not a hater per se. I've, I used to be somewhat of a fan, and I used to defend him, and it started to get kind of like a little bit out of control. Um, but he's going to be good for the Warriors. I mean, they just stuck it in with the Nuggets, defending champs tonight without him. He obviously would have been helpful for that three point loss, but I know that I know that Steph's going to be happy to get him back. Um, he's uh, his partner in crime, basically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it'll although Draymond does all the crime. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it will be interesting to see him kind of you know weave himself back into the into the flow of things and uh, how long it'll take him to kind of figure it out. Because I think too he was actually having one of his better years as far as shooting, uh, especially from three that he's had in the last you know, probably four or five years. And now he's been out for so long that maybe he kind of lost it. So it'll be interesting to see what he comes back like and then what they end up doing by the deadline as well. Cause they're kind of in the same boat as the Lakers are hovering around or just below 500. So let's see what happens. Yep. 
Well, we're going to kind of end the episode and end basketball with a little new thing that we're going to try to do. It's not like an official segment or anything, but I know a lot of shows do this, and we're going to kind of give our own little take on it. Maybe maybe on a weekly basis, maybe on a bi-weekly basis we'll update this, because sometimes throughout one week there's not like a lot of uh, games that could happen. But So maybe on a bi-weekly basis we kind of we kind of go this. But we're going to give – each of us are going to give the uh, top five power rankings, I guess you would say, for the NBA this week. Um you want me to go first, or do you want yeah, me to first? go for it. Give me your five. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go in reverse order from five to one. Right. Um, mine in particular, let me read them, and then I'll give a little bit of an explanation. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Number five is going to be the Milwaukee Bucks. Number four is going to be the Denver Nuggets. Number three is going to be the Minnesota Timberwolves. Two is the Oklahoma City Thunder. And one is the team I wish was not one, but that would be the Boston Celtics. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I went... I think the best team in the league is Boston, so it's kind of hard to not put them at one. However, they did just lose to my number two, which is Oklahoma City. I went West heavy up top, which is besides one, obviously, because Boston is the best team regardless of whether or not I like it. Uh, Because I just think the West, as we talked about previously when you mentioned the Heat to Lakers record, is just stacked. It's just stacked. Oklahoma City, I think, takes the nod, in my opinion, over... Minnesota currently, at least this week, because they have just been on tear. They beat Denver on the road. They beat Minnesota. They beat Boston. Now, granted, I think they lost last night to a low. I forgot who they played, but they lost last night. But, I mean, dude, they've been on such a tear. You know, they can't win them all. Yeah. Um, Denver, obviously, is the defending champs. They're still up there. I think they're third in the West. You can't ever really count them out. And then I kind of wrap it up with Milwaukee. Philly is kind of peeping on my list, um, but that's pretty much kind of where I'm at. Milwaukee, Denver, Minnesota, Oklahoma City, and Boston at one. Shoot. Not a bad. I have a couple similar, but I do have a couple different as well. Um, I'll go backwards from five to one as well. Five, I do have Milwaukee as well. I kind of see them. They're starting to figure some things out. Their defense, as we talked about against Indiana, is not very good. So if it's a high-powered offense, they might struggle, especially with Lillard there at the top. He's not as good defensively as Drew Holiday was when they had him. Um, At four, I have Oklahoma City. I think part of the reason I have them a little further back than you is I still don't know what they're going to be like come playoff time because they're so young and inexperienced. So I'm still kind of like, they're good, but I don't want to give them too much credit, which is the same reason I left Minnesota out of the top five as well. I just Mm, don't trust them enough yet to think that they're going to be good enough to move on in the playoffs. They'll probably make it. And again, it's early. And and like you said, Denver's three in the power in the uh, Western conference. I think as the year goes on and now that they got Aaron Gordon back from the whole dog bite thing and they kind of get Murray kind of situated and and they're just really deep with Reggie Jackson and Christian Brown. So I have, I I understand where you're coming from there. Um, I do actually have Philly as number three. Now I know they're number three in the Eastern conference, but I just feel like they're so deep and Nick nurse is a huge coaching difference from them from doc rivers. True. Um, I think that the other part of Philly too is, is they're good now with Maxi and, Embiid is the one and two punch, and they've they've kind of done what Miami does, is where they run the offense through Embiid or Adebayo if you're Miami, and then everything kind of works from there. Like he's been passing and has probably more assists than I think he's had in most seasons. So I feel like Philly's right there. And then number two, I have Denver, the defending champ. Like I said, they're getting healthy. They got Gordon back. Uh, Murray was out for a little bit there, but now he's kind of back and getting his thing. Jokic had a couple bad games, I think, three or four weeks ago against one of them was against the Clippers. He just was flat out terrible. But, you know, everybody's going to have a couple bad games, and I think he's going to be better going into the second half of the season. And, unfortunately, I'm with you there. Number one, Boston. It's hard to argue. They're the best team in the league. Yep. They've Sorry, Loff. Your team's, team's good. Get over <laughs> it. They had that West Coast trip. They came and beat almost everybody in California, including the Lakers on Christmas Day. Um, they just, they're just they very solid. They're probably going to – I think, if I remember right, I think Brad Stevens talked about they want to get a bigger another big wing on the outside to help them moving forward. So they're going to make a, a move of some sort at the, at the deadline. Um, and the biggest thing though for them is, is Porzingis health. If Porzingis is healthy and doing what he's doing, he makes a huge difference for them. Um, otherwise if he's out, it's, it'll completely change the way and the dynamic of their offense. And even defense, he's been pretty well having some block shots more than I would anticipate, but it's kind of easy when you're seven, two, I guess, to block shots compared to not being seven, two. So and they yeah, traded like a paper clip and yeah. like, I think an envelope to get him. So yeah, it's well, you know, kind of ridiculous. I think bro. Washington was just trying to unload his contract. And again, he's a big, tall guy, but he's had ankle and knee issues. And, you know, moving forward, once you have them at all, it, it doesn't usually get better as you get older and, and a little slower. So it'll be interesting to see how they go moving forward. But I'm with you there as far as Boston being the number one team. 
So we basically have everybody. So you took out Minnesota and replaced it with Philly, and then we have a different order. Okay, so yeah, we're about the same. I mean, I just am so impressed with Oklahoma City and the way Chet is, yep. is like the Porzingis, right, to, to, yeah, to Boston. Um, it's just super impressive to see, especially since they were able to beat Boston. Of course, I was happy about that. Of yeah, course, OKC of is deep. I mean, SGA alone is amazing. Chet Holmgren's probably going to be Rookie of the Year. You have Lou Dort, who's a great 3 and D guy at the two position. Um, they just, they, they've been so Josh Giddy. Yeah. Josh, Giddy, been, you know, yeah, allowed like to play for now. Kids. Uh, they've been just building these guys together as a group over the last few years. And even though Chet didn't play last year because of the injury, I mean, he was all around the team. He's constantly learning, watching film and catching and picking things up and picking their brains. So obviously it's worked out really well for them on that end. And yeah, I'm with you. I think OKC could be really scary, but I just think when it comes down to the end of the season, even though Denver's at yeah. three now, I think Denver kind of works their way back up to the one or two and then has home court throughout. And, and going to Denver in the regular season and beating them is hard, but having to do it four Definitely. times in a playoff series when they're the defending champs. And they I mean, everybody, prepare on team, for you. everybody on that team knows their role and they don't go outside of it. And that's part of the reason they're so good and won the title last year. So. You know who like we could use? If only uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope. Wouldn't that be cool if like, he played for the Lakers. Oh, wait, he did play for the Lakers. I was right. Dude, okay, when you left earlier and Lof, as we were prepping, then you left and came back, Loff and I were talking about, and that was the one guy I brought up too. I don't know why they included him in that rest trade besides the contract match. That's the one guy I would have kept because he's perfect. And when he got traded to Denver before last season, I was like, dang, that's going to be huge because Murray's kind of like Lillard. He's really good offensively. Defense is not so great, but when you have another guard next to you that can take the pressure off and then you have Jokic on the back end and Aaron Gordon can fly and – you know, block shots all over the place. Oh, and well. KCP shoots like 38% from three. Yeah. Yeah. They're, uh, they're really good. <sighs> hey, you know what though? If yeah. Denver wins back to back, that's cool with me. It's better than uh, any other teams. I don't want Boston. True. I like KCP too. Good for him for winning last year. Props, bro. Oh, Props, yeah. bro. Good for him. Good for him. So again, another episode concluding. We're going to get back to it next week on Monday. And oh, I promise you, we're going to get back to the <laughs> MILF Mondays and we're going to get back to the This Week in Sports History. But we are going to wrap it on that one. Uh, if you would like to go back and check out uh, some of the other This Weeks in Sports Histories or MILF Mondays, where would they be able to find that, man? Yeah, always uh, you can search uh, Our View from the Bench and you can go on to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube and watch our videos. And like Brendan said, we're going to try to get back on our schedule. The holidays have been kind of crazy and obviously was wasn't feeling so good so we had to make sure yeah. he's back and can talk because there was a couple of days you were you were not able to really do much of that and uh even today you saw much better than you did two days ago so we're we're in the we're in the discussion of improving there and hopefully get back to our schedule exactly thanks man uh, also don't forget to follow us on twitter and instagram at our view ftb i i know i say this too often but Corey, you can attest to it we're starting to find uh, different programs and stuff like that so i can actually try to create more content for the instagram page i want to try to create something to where i can put something out daily uh whether that be just a snippet from the show or some sort of other fact uh, we'd love uh, for you to come and just follow us on there. So yeah, and we're also. How is, uh, I'm gonna try uh, to figure out how this will work too, but I also kind of want to look into maybe having a voicemail uh, possibility of people calling in and leaving us <gasps> questions that we can yeah. then, uh, play on the air and answer. Uh, obviously, t- people can tweet at us and uh, reply to the polls that we put on the Spotify uh, podcast as well. But it, I think having a call in or a voicemail to leave and kind of play it on the air and then answer the questions will be something we're gonna try to look forward to doing too. That's a cool idea. I like that. That's a great idea. Sweet. Um, how's the rest of your week look? I mean, I know it's Friday already tomorrow. You got a long weekend ahead? Uh, yeah, I got the end of the homestand here for the Ducks. So tomorrow we got a game against, who are we playing tomorrow? Winnipeg, which is, uh, I think it's Pride Night tomorrow. And then Sunday we are playing Detroit for Legacy Night number two, which is celebrating the second decade of the organization since we're doing our 30th anniversary celebration this season. There will be a Timu bobblehead giveaway on Sunday. So if ooh, you ooh. are into bobbleheads, it is. I saw it in the office today. It's very nice. It's him hoisting the Stanley Cup above his head when they won back in 2007. Oh. So the face isn't perfectly looking like Timu, but it's, it's pretty good. Head. And the rest of the bobblehead itself, like I said, the Stanley Cup part of it is actually really cool. So looking forward to get through this homestand. And then uh, we'll have a couple weeks of them on the road and some concerts coming up. But just trying to get through this weekend, get through this homestand, and then get ready for the uh, – I mean, we're technically – I think tomorrow is our 21st home game of 41. So we're – we're halfway through the season halfway. as far as Damn. home games go. So, yeah, just looking forward Speaking to Speaking of 41, and... this is episode 41, right? You are correct. We are in episode 41 today. Um, so, yeah, just looking forward to get that and done. And then, uh, you know, week 18, then we'll see what happens on Sunday. But how is your week looking? 
Um, the rest of it should be chill. Friday, thank goodness, is here. I just need more rest, man. I know I'm feeling a little bit better, but I still just am not. I'm super fatigued, honestly. So just really trying to get back up to like the normal energy levels and stuff like that. So I'm going to be resting besides obviously watching a lot of football on Saturday, football on Sunday, and football on Monday. Yeah, we'll Monday be back night. here on Monday to cover a bunch of uh, the happenings, whether that is both the NFL and college football. So make sure that you tune in and check that one out. Um, appreciate everybody though stopping by and seeing things from our view from the bench. I'm Brendan. And I'm Corey. Like we always say, enjoy the sports until we talk again. Peace. Thank you.